Well, many of you have made plans this weekend probably to be with family. Uh, you've made plans to spend some time with friends perhaps because this is Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend often marks what is commonly thought of as the beginning of summer vacation. And Memorial Day weekend is that beginning of it, usually traditionally. Uh, Labor Day weekend is considered the end of the travel season for summer. And, uh, you know, so it's one of those days where we kind of know what to expect coming up in, for a couple of months, where a lot of people are going to be out, they're going to be traveling and on vacation. There are a couple of similar holidays uh, to Memorial Day. One is known as Armed Forces Day. That's a day where we think about those who are currently serving in our armed forces. There's also Veterans Day, which is a day that is to celebrate all those who have served or are serving. It's sort of a, a sweeping, all-encompassing day when we think about them all. But Memorial Day is specific. Memorial Day is a day specifically designed to think about who, those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Those who have given their lives in defense of the things that we believe in here in this country. And I think it's, it's often appropriate to think about memorials. And, and on a weekend like this, I think it's especially appropriate to think about the ultimate memorial. The memorial of the Lord, which we gather around a table and we celebrate each and every Sunday. And I want to invite you, if you would, to take your Bible out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 26 as we, once again... And as we always should, memorialize our Lord, and that will be our home text in Matthew chapter 26. I want to say to you, I'm really encouraged today. What a beautiful day it is. It's a beautiful Sunday. I so appreciate one of our elders getting up and, and wording a prayer for all those who are in need here in our Highland family. I'm encouraged by the fact that we finally got a Sunday where the sun is shining outside. Man, we never seem to get those this time of year. So maybe, maybe. The door is opening and the sunlight's peering in. We're glad for that. But in the midst of that, when we gather for worship, I just want to say to you that Christianity, every time we gather as the Lord's people, it should challenge us to our very core about who we are. We're very encouraged by seeing each other today, encouraged by the weather, encouraged maybe by the, the weekend's plans. But the truth is, if you want to come to church to feel comforted, very often we might choose a different belief system than Christianity. Because I'm here to tell you, when you gather in a worship assembly, a worship assembly directed toward Christ, there are some things that should shake you to your core and cause you to examine yourself in the eyes of God. <laughs> if you're just looking for comfort, let me tell you, Christianity is not your place. Christianity should always challenge us in very specific ways. One of the greatest deacons and, and one of the greatest men that I've ever known in the Highland family was Brother David Pilkington. And many years ago when I started coming uh, to, to Highland as, as a part of the Highland family, Brother David used to have this saying, and, and I've, I've tried to honor that saying over the years. He said, I think every year it is important to spend at least one Sunday just talking about the Lord's Supper. There's a lot of wisdom in that particular statement. Because so much of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing revolves around this particular event and this particular table. And just about every year since I came and since I heard him say that, I've tried to honor that thought where we just gather on a Sunday to think in our lesson about the Lord's Supper. When you think about a worship assembly, you know, we have five acts that we often talk about and tout that, that really bring to life our faith as we gather together as God's people. We worship God through the Word of God. We worship God as we gather in communion. We worship God as we sing songs of praise, as we word these prayers and they, they rise up from, from our lips to the ears of God, and we also pray and we honor our God through exalting Him and thanking Him for His incredible works in our lives. So I want you to, are you listening? I want you to take just a moment, look at this screen behind me, and take just a snapshot of those five things, and now 
allow your eyes to drift down to Matthew chapter 26 and just take a, a survey of the landscape for a moment and notice that Matthew 26 is laid out, are you listening? It's laid out almost like a worship assembly. <laughs> because in the early portion of the chapter, what we get are songs that are being, hymns that are being sung. We have a call to worship. We have the collection being spoken about. We have a self-examination before communion. We have the Lord Himself giving a short but very meaningful lesson. And we have the presence of prayer. We could take a step back from Matthew 26 and just look at it and say, we have encapsulated for us here something of a worship outline. And as we dive down into that worship outline, I want you to notice that at the center of this entire text, and indeed at the apex of this text, is the self-giving Lord Jesus inviting disciples to gather around a table to remember Him and to honor Him. This is a very important place that we're reading from here in Matthew 26. And so as you kind of continue to look at your, your Matthew 26 and maybe you're looking at the headings, I want to direct your attention to something that I find very, uh, very interesting. Because we have here in this text, we have the person of Jesus. He is grace embodied. He is grace walking on planet earth. And on either side of him, we have betrayal. Allow your eyes to drift to verses 20 down through verse 25 and you'll see betrayal on one side of the person of grace. And on the other side of the supper, we see verses 31 and following, we have denial. Here is the person of Jesus, the ultimate embodiment of grace, and He's surrounded by betrayal and denial in the midst of the observance of this beautiful communion. So I want to invite you, if you would, if you've got an outline, look on the inside of it. Let's think about some things regarding this most important observance that we engage our hearts in every week. And the very first thing I want to, to invite you to think about and to contemplate, write this down at number one. And that is, be sure that the point of the supper for you, for me, as we observe it, be sure that the point of the supper is Jesus Himself. This is not some mere ceremony that we observe. You cannot have the motion without the emotion attached. They go hand in hand. And I don't know how anybody could ever observe this event, take part in this moment of our worship without engaging the heart and the mind and the emotions. I don't know how that works. And all of those things should be directed toward especially the person of Jesus. Look there in your verse 17, Matthew 26, verse 17, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now mentally just circle that idea about the Passover in your mind. What is the Pascha or the Passover? The Passover always challenged Israel to look backwards in history at a time when they were delivered from Egyptian bondage. And you remember, they had to take the blood and they had to put it over the door in order that the wrath of God would pass by their house. And this was the beginning, the roots of Passover. And from Exodus chapter 6 thereafter, uh, the people of God would always celebrate the Passover with four cups Surrounded by four phrases from Exodus chapter 6. I will bring you out from under the, the yoke of the Egyptians. I will rescue from your slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. So Passover recalled bondage and slavery. It was something as an event that involved as a necessity a spotless lamb that was sacrificed for the people in their stead. They were to remove all leaven. And eventually, this particular meal came to be a meal where they not only looked backwards to their, you know, remembering their, their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, but they also looked forward 
They looked forward to a time when the Messiah would show up. And the Messiah would bring healing to all of the land. This is a very jam-packed event that they took place in when they observed the Passover. And in Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus challenges all throughout all time thereafter who would follow Him. What does He say? He says to all of us, in essence, do this, why? Do this in what? Remembrance of me. Time out. I thought Passover was about Egyptian bondage. It was. And Jesus takes this monumental ceremony and He shifts its meaning to where He Himself is the center of this discussion. One of the things that I love about Matthew, I, I love Matthew is so near and dear to my heart. I love all the Gospel accounts, but Matthew is so beautiful in, in so many unexpected ways to me. And one of the reasons I love Matthew so much is that Matthew is so Jesus-centered. Matthew's Gospel has the name of Jesus mentioned 80 times and 37 times just in the section where Jesus is suffering. That's 157 times versus 80 total times the name of Jesus is mentioned in all the other Gospel accounts. Matthew's Gospel is Jesus-centered. He is giving us the name of Jesus over and over and over again. And I recall, I wonder as Matthew, he's over and over giving this name to the reader, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It reminds me of chapter 1, verse 21. When the angel made that declaration, you shall call His name, what? Jesus. Why? Because the meaning of that name is He will save His people from their sin. Matthew's reminding us of that. Notice how Jesus-centered verse 18 is. He said, go into the city. In answer to the question, we will observe the Passover. Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher. There are a lot of teachers of the law in Israel. He doesn't have to clarify for this guy. The teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Jesus is very much the focus of this event and this text. But I want here in your verse 18, will you notice mentally that word time, kairos. Time, that was a word that, that meant something very special. In your verse 18 where it's talking about time, the word time here means big world events. You know, a lot of times when we, we talk about time, we speak of it in terms of chronology. You ever talk about chronological we do it every, every week, whether we even realize it. Uh, I've got a calendar on my phone, Google Calendar. Do you have a calendar where you write stuff down, maybe? And what are you doing? You're engaging in a chronological view of time as you're looking for your week. But just imagine it for a moment. You know as well as I do, there are some weeks where you might have a lot of things going on, but there's one really, really, really big thing happening that particular week, right? We've all had those weeks. And Jesus uses a word here, kairos, for time, where He's not talking about a chronology of events. He is talking about one really, really big event that's about to take place. And what is that big event that He has in mind? Can I remind you that in one day, the event which will shape all of human history. The event on which all of human history hinges is about to take place. And Jesus knows this is on His horizon. He knows this is about to happen. And because of that, He desires to overlook this Passover and to observe it with His disciples. But He shifts the meaning. Everything about this, He's going to make it exalting of He Himself. He's going to make it something where the disciples revere and honor the work He is about to perform. Now let's pick it up, verse 20 and following. When it was evening, He reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, He said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray Me. Imagine you're one of the closest disciples and you're sitting down to observe the greatest 
moment of remembrance of Israel's history that you observe all year long. And you're all so close, you're a family. You, you've been on the roads with this traveling rabbi for three years. And now he looks at you, those, are, those who should be the closest to him, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. How would you think about that? How would you feel about it? Notice their reaction. They were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? And what's the answer to that question? Can I, can I challenge us for a moment? <laughs> can I challenge us for a moment in answering that question? When the disciples say, is it me? Can I suggest to you, there's a meta answer and there's an immediate answer. You know what I mean by that? There's an immediate answer because we as readers, we all know who the bad guy at the table is right there, right, in this story. We all know who this guy is that's going to betray him. But there's also a larger answer. Why is it that Jesus is going to the cross? Let me ask it a different way. Is there anybody sitting at that table in that moment who's absolutely innocent? Are there any of us here today as we gather again around this table who's absolutely innocent? In the classic Western, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the lines of demarcation are pretty well laid out. As you're watching, by the way, this is the third in a trilogy of Westerns. They're called Spaghetti Westerns because they were made in Italy. I know that's a terrible title. That's just what they were called. And in this series of movies, you know who the good guy is. It's Clint Eastwood. And you know who the bad guy is. It's Lee Van Cleef. And he does a great job. And he plays the part perfectly. And he even wears a signature black hat. Just in case you miss that he's the bad guy. Let me tell you, in the immediate context, there's a bad guy. Everybody knows who it is. And the Scripture is saying to us, He is about to have an interaction with the person of Jesus. Jesus says, One of you is going to betray Me. Now if you're Judas and you know what's about to take place, Jesus is not so direct as to out you to the rest of the disciples, but it's direct enough that G Judas knows that Jesus knows, right? One of you is about to betray Me. Can you imagine? What was going through Judas' mind? So number one, make sure that the supper is about Jesus Himself. Number two, we prepare for the supper with self-examination. And here we find a moment where all the disciples are, are now examining themselves as they're gathered around this table for the first time with a new meaning. I want to I take kind of a, a, a trip down a cul-de-sac. What's a cul-de-sac? We're going to turn down a cul-de-sac and we're going to circle right back out and come, come back to where we were at the table with Judas in just a moment. But the classic text in Paul on the Lord's Supper is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want you to notice what Paul writes. He says it follows that anyone who eats the bread or drinks of the uh, cup of the Lord unworthily or in an unworthy fashion will be guilty of desecrating the body and the blood of the Lord. And a man must test or examine himself before eating his share of the bread and drinking from the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment on himself if he does not discern the body. I want you just to notice these words in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and 28. And I want you to ask yourself the question, should you take the Lord's Supper if you feel unworthy? Let me tell you, if you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong question. In context, unworthily is not sin. Let me give you a heads up. If you think when he's talking about observing the Lord's Supper unworthily and it has to do with sin, I, I want to suggest you please talk to me afterwards because we probably need to talk about the doctrine of sin. Because you probably have a very low view of sin. <laughs> Let me, let me prove my point very quickly. How many of you love Jesus as much as you should love Jesus? 
moving on. <laughs> Unworthily is not sin. He identifies what he means in the last part of that verse where he says that unworthy means not discerning the body. So here's the deal. When the elements come before you, don't just take a chip and a sip and pass it on without thinking about what these things represent. That it represents the body. <laughs> and it represents the covenant blood of Jesus. Never partake of it in an unworthy fashion where you're just going through the motions without the mental observance. Coming out of the cul-de-sac, back to our table. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And my suggestion is that all of us ought to sit there at that table with them right now in this moment and ask, is it me? And if we self-examine ourselves to that level, we're going to ask, answer the question, you know, I know we're talking about Judas, but at some level I've contributed to this situation. There's a reason Jesus is going to the cross and one, whatever, how many ever people have ever lived, one one hundred billionth of the reason is me, David Morris. I'm one of the reasons Jesus is going to the cross. I'm one of the reasons Jesus is about to be betrayed. So here is Jesus, and He says in your verse 21, are you looking there in verse 21? I think most of your translations will say, one of you will betray me. Very literally, it means hand me over. Can I tell you something really interesting? In Isaiah 53, the, the, the incredible you know, passage about the suffering servant, over and over again, this word is used, this very word, that he will be, the suffering servant will be handed over. It's used twice just in Isaiah 53 of the suffering servant. And Jesus here takes that word from Isaiah 53 and he owns it. And he says, somebody is going to hand me over because I am that suffering servant. So Jesus knows what he's about to get into. Is it me, Lord? Every Okay, so here's just a little insight I came across some years ago in studying the text. Because if you look in your verse 22, and I hope this will be interesting to you, where it says they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, and it says then one after another. Do you see that in your text where it says one after another? Very literally, the Greek text means every one of them, one after the other, every one of them started asking, Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Every one of them went down the line. And then notice who's last. Verse 25. And he does not say, Lord, is it me? Instead, he says, you don't mean me, do you, Rabbi? It's a little too, too little too late. First of all, why wouldn't after three years Judas say, Rabboni, my beloved teacher? And he's more than a... It's so obvious by this point, after three years, he's more than a teacher. But he's also the last one to ask, is it me? And Jesus says, well, you said it. <laughs> what, what an answer. You said so. Well, Jesus, what he's about to do next is he's about to say in his own words what his sacrifice means to us. So write this down at number three. The bread tells us what Jesus did by becoming human. The bread reminds us of the incarnation of Jesus. That, that though He had a heavenly estate, He lowered Himself to become human. And He did that with a specific task in mind. A sacrificial task in mind. So you notice your verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it. And He gave it new meaning. Not just Passover meaning, but now He says, take, eat, why? Why? Is it just Passover? No. Take, eat, because now this is what? Now it's My body. Remember the incarnation. Remember the work of Jesus in just becoming flesh. He broke it, the Scripture says, and gave it to the disciples. I want you to notice all the verbs here in this. He took 
all our pronouns. He blessed. He broke. He gave. He say it, said. Over all these, it's all about Jesus giving through the symbolism of these elements. When you partake of this, remember of the gifts of the work of Christ. What He's done for us over and over again. So what we get from this text is the presence of Jesus is with us in a special way through the act of communion. Years ago, I got the honor to go to uh, Washington, D.C. And if you ever go there, one of the great things you get to do is to see the monuments that are there. I was especially struck at that time by the Vietnam Memorial. And any of you who've ever been there, I mean, it's just unbelievable to see this stretch of names. Stretch of names and what had happened to them. Well, they're gone. They're never coming home. And some years ago, I came across this particular painting, which depicts one of them, presumably maybe somebody who came home when, his, when the others didn't. I don't know, maybe even a son of one who stayed there and gave himself. But you see how it's illustrated. With hand on the memorial, and on the other side, what? Those whom he knew. Reaching back. And there's something like that that takes place in our Lord's Supper. There's something like that that takes place when we partake of the bread. Because Jesus is here with us in a special way with the Supper. He gives it to us. And I want to say to you, it's only for those who would follow Jesus. If you don't know whether or not you're a disciple of Jesus today, do do yourself a favor. Don't partake of it. And then come talk to me afterwards. You know, we can make sure. <laughs> the Scripture helps us to know whether or not we are followers of Jesus. Uh, around about the, the 4th century, there was a very well-known preacher by the name of John Chrysostom. And he had some church members who would come to him and say, Man, when we observe the Lord's Supper, I wish I could just see His face. I wish we could just touch His clothes. And Chrysostom, in a sermon, he wrote about it. He said, how very many say to me, I long to see his face. I long to touch his clothes. Behold, in his supper, you do see him. You touch, you partake. And while you long to see his clothes, he is giving of himself to you, not only to look at, but to touch and to receive. The word here is eucharista, and it literally means to hug. And there's a sense in which we could say this memorial is God's embrace to His people. It is something where God is showing His love. And that leads us to the fourth idea and the last of the elements, and that is the cup. For the cup tells us what Jesus did in His atoning blood. The cup tells us what Jesus did in His atoning blood. And Jesus invites us, in essence, to drink every week of His salvation. I think often during the Lord's Supper, I know you all have your own ways of thinking and and kind of getting your mind right, but for me, the song when I surveyed the wondrous cross is so powerful here because of the words, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose? So rich a crown. And so Jesus then says, Drink of it all of you, for this is My blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That word cup's interesting. Already in this very context, we've seen Jesus And in many other instances, use the word cup to refer to the time and moment of His death. In fact, earlier we just saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He prayed what? Lord, if it be Your will, let this cup pass from Me. But not My will, Your will be done. This idea of cup is a metaphor for death. So what Jesus is doing here in this verse, if you looked at verse 26 and then following, He's preaching for us a great sermon. It's a short sermon. 
but it may be the greatest thought that you and I could ever wrap our minds around. That this is the blood of God's covenant, Jesus' covenant to us for the remission or forgiveness of our sin. And whether I do a good job on a particular Sunday, whether you can't stand to listen to the sound of my voice or you want to make fun of me or whatever, that's okay. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Jesus at the Lord's table always preaches the perfect sermon. Every single week, He says it just right. My blood for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the perfect sermon. So if the blood of bulls and goats was incredibly powerful, how much more so is the power behind the blood of Jesus? Jesus is saying, by using the word covenant, this is my vow to you. Are you hearing me? If you are a disciple of Jesus, Jesus has made vows to you. And therefore, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ, His Son. He's made vows to you. So, Jude 21, keep yourself in the love of God. Don't leave that. Why would anybody ever want to do that? Jesus means what He's saying in this text. So, every week, we gather around a table. And I want to suggest to you from Sunday to Sunday, it's the divine medicine that you and I need. The Passover has now been superseded by the Lord's Supper, by the command of the Lord. One day, the Lord's Supper will morph into the great celebration banquet of heaven itself. And we'll get to sit down at a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with Jesus at the head of that table. And I look forward to that day, don't you? And we'll celebrate all of the incredible works of God through Christ. Throughout all the thousands of years, He was working for your joy. We'll sit at that table. But in the meantime, can I remind you that Jesus invites us every week around this table. And more than that, can I suggest to you that in between, He knows we're going to fail Him in some way. Every single week, we're going to fail Jesus. And every week, He calls us back to this table Back to the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray about it. Father in heaven, we come before you today. We're just so very thankful for this memorial, for what it means to us, for what your Son has transformed it into. Help us to partake in a worthy fashion, remembering your Son in every element. Remembering His work. Remembering His command. And in preparation for that, Lord, would You help us to examine ourselves and honestly ask the question, is it me? Do I need to change and do I need to repent? It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The Apostle Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The exact same phrase that we find here in Matthew 26 when Jesus says, I give my blood as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. It's the same phrase. My question to you is, have you been through the cleansing waters that hold the blood of Jesus? We're going to sing a song of invitation. You need help. You need prayers. We want to assist you. Stand